Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Major Annabelle Monroe from the Secretary of the Air Force Public Affairs. And in just a few moments, uh, the Honorable Kristen Jones, performing the duties of Undersecretary of the Air Force, and General Mike Greiner, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Budget, will be presenting the Department of the Air Force Fiscal Year 2025 President, President's Budget Overview Brief briefing. If you were unable to pick up a packet earlier in the day, we have some of those, so please let us know and we'll make sure you have a packet. And then following the brief briefing, Honorable Jones and General Greiner will take your questions. We uh, don't have anybody on the line, so we don't need questions from the line, but when possible, we ask in the interest of time, you limit it to one question and then one follow-up question. Uh, without further ado, the Honorable Kristen Jones. Good afternoon. I'm Kristen Jones, here today performing the duties of Undersecretary of the Air Force. I also serve as the Assistant Secretary for Financial Management and Comptroller. I'm joined by Major General Mike Greiner, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Budget. Thank you for joining us. Next slide, please. During this presentation of the Department of the Air Force's Fiscal Year 2025 President's Budget Request, I'll provide the strategic backdrop for our budgetary decisions, outline the overview of the Department's request, and present the air and space capabilities required to support the National Defense Strategy. Major General Greiner will highlight the appropriation level details. Next slide, please. The National Defense Strategy identifies the People's Republic of China as the pacing challenge and most consequential strategic competitor for the department. It also recognizes the acute threat of Russia and its continued aggression, and the persistent threats posed by North Korea, Iran, and violent extremist organizations. The Department of the Air Force FY25 President's Budget Request is guided around this framework. It funds essential nuclear modernization, preserves previous years' substantial advances in operational imperatives, focuses on foundational accounts to support the readiness of our force, and ensures an executable budget year. The Air Force's core functions remain unchanged. Air superiority, global strike, rapid global mobility, command and control, and intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. The Space Force's efforts reflect its indispensable support that underpins all other joint operations. And since space has become a contested domain, the Space Force is continuing its transformation into a warfighting service to secure our interests in, from, and to space. These efforts are guided by the three overarching Department of Defense priorities of defending the nation, taking care of people, and succeeding through teamwork. Next slide, please. Defending the nation requires constant vigilance in all domains. The DAF supports this priority through investments in air and space superiority, global strike, and readiness. The ability to compete, deter, and if necessary, win future high-end conflicts requires a force that is right-sized, capable, sustainable, and recognizing the Fiscal Responsibility Act spending caps affordable and can operate across the entire continuum of mission sets. To that end, this budget request sustains the modernization momentum of the operational imperatives, while taking measured risk in the near term, safeguarding necessary investments in readiness, which is a top priority of the department. We preserve funds supporting our readiness enablers, such as weapon system sustainment and our flying hour program. For the Air Force, our FY25 budget request procures 42 F-35s, 18 F-15 EXs, and requests multi-year procurement for the JASM, LRASM, and AMRAM munitions to enhance our competitive capabilities and maintain air domain lethality and precision attack. Nuclear modernization remains a top priority, foundational to integrated deterrence, and requires capitalizing the ICBM and bomber legs of the triad. The nuclear program, our ICBM replacement Sentinel, is continuing in development. The B-21 Raider is executing its flight test campaign and was recently approved for low rate initial production. For the Space Force, we are investing $4.7 billion to field a proliferated multi-orbit missile warning architecture. Operating across different orbits and utilizing a variety of sensor technologies, 
This capability limits an adversary's ability to act against U.S. interests without our knowledge and supports decision making at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels, providing critical information in real time. Next slide. The DAF is committed to attracting and retaining the best airmen and guardians in the world. We've continued to break down barriers to service and make progress thanks to Congress's significant support, increasing economic security for our airmen and guardians through cost of living adjustments to basic pay, BAH, BAS, and the basic needs allowance, and through the passage of the Space Force Personnel Management Act. This landmark piece of legislation will enable us to build the first truly modern personnel management system in the armed forces, and we believe it will allow us to better align service requirements with member intent. In fiscal year 2024, active duty Air Force and Space Force are on track to meet recruiting goals, exceeding numbers from the last several years. The reserves and Air National Guard recruiting are trending upward, with the reserves expected to reach 98% of its goal and the Air National Guard exceeding FY23 by 12%. To improve our ability to attract the best possible talent from all backgrounds and geographic regions, the DAF has opened our bases to local communities, showcasing the value of service to the public. We're back on track to meet our recruiting goals, in part because of the bonuses and incentive pays we offered last year. Now in FY25, we are investing $1.6 billion to recruit and retain airmen and guardians, and funding $1.1 billion in bonuses and retention programs for 118,000 critical positions. To maintain our talent, the DAF is focused on quality of life improvement for airmen and guardians, investing $1.5 billion for mission facilities, family housing, dormitories, and child care centers, to ensure they have the resources required to thrive. The department remains focused on truly taking care of our people at every level. This includes timely imp implementation of the Independent Review Commission's recommendations and programs, expanding victim care and support for victims of sexual assault. Additionally, we're preparing airmen and guardians for the challenges of great power competition by building mental health skills and positive com command climates. This includes $451 million in the FY25 budget request for interpersonal and self-directed violence prevention and response to include initiatives focused on resilience and well-being. We are also increasing the presence of embedded mental health personnel in line units to prepare for contingency operations. Next slide, please. In line with Secretary Austin's priority of succeeding through teamwork, we are working diligently with our sister services, other government organizations, commercial industry, and allies and partners across the spectrum of operations. These partnerships are a center of gravity for national security and are critical to achieving our objectives and ensuring integrated deterrence. As an example, we're providing $538 million to sustain agile combat employment to set the theater, establish distributed command and control, and train mission-ready airmen. These efforts set conditions to achieve the joint warfighting concept scheme of maneuver, and we are working with allies and partners to integrate these approaches into joint exercises and training. The Space Force is partnering with a variety of government agencies to unify efforts for mutual benefit in space, including $6.2 billion in commercial space launches, and expanding the space data network, the backbone of C3BM, to deliver resilient space-based capabilities to the Joint Force. Additionally, the FY25 budget devotes $4.4 billion developing disaggregated satellite communications constellations capable of operating through contested and degraded environments. Finally, we're investing $3.4 billion in the next generation air dominance family of systems. This includes $600 million for the Collaborative Combat Aircraft, CCA, which alongside work with the Navy, leverages a consortium of nearly 30 industry partners with expertise in air vehicles, mission systems, autonomy, and software development. This funding supports accelerated development, testing, and fielding of platforms to increase joint force lethality and survivability at an affordable cost. Next slide. 
In the following chart, you'll see two sets of numbers with the FY24 budget request on the left and the FY25 president's budget request on the right. The stacked columns here highlight the department's budget request consisting of the Air Force and Space Force budgets. Looking at the bar chart for FY25, excluding the $45.1 billion in non-blue funding, the Department of the Air Force is requesting $217.5 billion. This is a 2.4 billion or 1.1% increase over the 24 president's budget request. The Air Force budget of $188.1 billion is a 3 billion or 1.6% increase over the 24 request. And the Space Force budget of $29.4 billion is a 0.6 billion or 2% decrease from the 24 request. On the right side of the slide, the upper pie chart breaks out the Air Force baseline and the Space Force baseline by appropriation. The next slides will de detail our efforts with a look at the appropriation for the department's budget requests. Now I'll turn it over to Major General Greiner to cover the overall top line for the Department of the Air Force and our appropriation level details. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On each appropriation slide, you will see a similar format. The funding tables show the overall department budget request and additional details for both the Air Force and Space Force. You will also see key budgetary changes between fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25. The pie chart in the top right corner highlights the relative respective appropriations portion of the total budget. The department's fiscal year 25 RD T&E budget request is $56.4 billion, a $1 billion increase over the fiscal year 24 requested position. This growth showcases the department's commitment to making the investments necessary to implement the national defense strategy. The Air Force's RD T&E fiscal year 25 budget request is $37.7 billion, a $1.5 billion or 4.1% increase over the fiscal year 24 requested position. This budget request provides $3.7 billion for the Sentinel program, continuing development efforts ensuring our land-based nuclear forces' ability to hold global targets at risk. It provides $2.7 billion for the B-21 Raider program, the cornerstone of the department's conventional and nuclear-capable deep strike force, as well as $623 million for the long-range standoff weapon program. The Air Force continues to invest in air superiority modernization with the next generation Air Dominance Family System. This budget request adds $815 million for continued technology maturation, risk reduction activities, and hardware prototyping efforts. NGAD will provide survivability, lethality, and interoperability while integrating future capabilities including uncrewed collaborative combat aircraft. On the next slide, we, next slide, we will look at the Space, or the Space Force RDT request. Next slide, please. The Space Force's RDT&E fiscal year 25 budget request, which accounts for 63% of the Space Force total budget, is $18.7 billion, representing a $500 million or 2.6% decrease from the fiscal year 24 requested position. This budget request continues to implement resilient architectures and embodies an, an uh, integrated deterrence approach to strengthening Space Force's ability to operate in a highly contested environment. Our fiscal year 25 budget request continues to modernize the SATCOM enterprise, both strategic and tactical capabilities. This request adds $413 million for the Evolve Strategic SATCOM program, providing global secure, jam resistant, and survivable SATCOM for presidential and national command authorities. This request also adds $237 million to begin the protected SAT, uh, tactical SATCOM global program. PTSG will disaggregate the X and KA band capabilities on separate satellites in geostationary Earth orbit. Additionally, an increase of $267 million in funding is requested from missile warning missile tracking capabilities, continuing to build out a proliferated architecture across low and medium Earth orbits to detect and track advanced missile launch signatures. The Space Development Agency's Tranche 1 efforts are focused on launching 28 LEO space vehicles beginning in fiscal year 25, while Space Systems Command continues their work integrating and testing nine MEO space vehicles for EPIC-1 plan launches in the fiscal year 26 and 27 timeframe. Finally, the budget request adds $111 million for space domain awareness systems, which include new network sensors and improved information integration capabilities across the space surveillance network. 
and provides $1.7 billion for the Space Development Agency's proliferated warfighter space architecture, a resilient military sensing and data transport layer in low Earth orbit, delivering key capabilities for clothing, closing long-range kill chains at speed and at scale. Next, let's review the highlights of the procurement portfolio. The department continues to invest in advanced capabilities, ensuring that our systems provide a warfighting edge over those of potential adversaries. The fiscal year 25 procurement request is $33.3 billion, a 2.1 billion or 5.9% increase from the fiscal year 24 requested position. For the Air Force, the budget request provides $5.9 billion to procure 42 F-35s, which is six less than the plan for in the fiscal year 24 budget request in fiscal year 25. Additionally, we request $1.8 billion to procure 18 F-15EXs, six less than planned for in the fiscal year 24 budget request in fiscal year 25. This budget request continues to make gains in the Air Force's Global Strike Core function, adding $353 million to the B-21 Raider program. The request also highlights our focus on procuring those critical munitions necessary to win in a high-end conflict. Continuing the multi-year procurement strategy requested in the fiscal year 24 budget to achieve synergies in producing 550 JASM ER, 115 LRASM, and 128 ARGAM ER missiles. Our ability to operate in, from, and to space effectively requires assured access. access being first to field new warfighting capabilities and the ability to reconstitute them if necessary. Driven by mission requirements, $2.2 billion is requested to support the procurement of a total of 11 launches, seven national security space launches, and four space development agency launches in fiscal year 25, compared to 15 total launches in fiscal year 24. Fiscal year 25 will mark the first year of the NSSL phase three launch service procurement. The Phase 3 dual-lane approach grows the number of launch service providers while ensuring high reliability for critical national security missions. Finally, the budget adds $527 million to procure two GPS-3 follow-on space vehicles in fiscal year 25. Now let's look at the request for operation and maintenance. Next slide, please. Operation and maintenance is the largest appropriation, making up 37% or $80.8 billion of the overall department's budget requests. O&M funds daily operations critical to sustaining, sustaining readiness, building resiliency, and enhancing our warfighting posture. The $2.3 billion, or 2.9% growth over our fiscal year requ 24 request, is largely driven by additional investments in people, weapon system sustainment, and flying hours. The fiscal year 25 request continues to prioritize the department's most resilient resource, its people. Our budget request adds two point, or sorry, $251 million to fully fund a 2% 2 per, 2 civilian pay raise, maintain support to family programs funding $419 million for child development centers and youth programs, provides $380 million for continued implementation of the Independent Review Commission's recommendations for violence, sexual assault, and suicide prevention and response, and targets $300 million for 29 unaccompanied dormitory and $50 million for Child Development Center FSRM projects. For the Air Force, weapon system sustainment requirements continue to grow, grow due to both aging legacy platforms and the acquisition of new, more complex weapon systems. In fiscal year 25, the Air Force adds $872 million to this portfolio, maintaining funding for 87% of our requirements. The fiscal year 25 Space Force O&M budget request increases to $5.2 billion, including $1.4 billion to support weapon system sustainment at 81% of the requirement, maintaining 52 weapon systems. We also add $42 million for defensive cyber operations, providing the capability to defend key Space Force mission systems and infrastructure. The budget request also provides $114 million to enhance the operational test and training infrastructure a key readiness inve investment that enables high-end testing and training, providing both blue and aggressor force training environments across the National Space Test and Training Complex. And finally, it dedicates $29 million towards Space Force of the, Space Force of the Future infrastructure initiatives. Next, I'll provide an overview of the military appropriations request. The Department of the Air Force's fiscal year 25 military personnel request is $42.9 billion, an $800, $800 million or 1.9% increase over the fiscal year 24 request. 
Total military end strength requested for the fiscal year 25 is 504,500 members, which closely aligns to end strength levels authorized in the fiscal year 24 NDAA. Our request resource is a 4.5% military pay raise for airmen and guardians. Additionally, to strengthen economic security for our service members and their families, the request adds $40 million to provide for a basic needs allowance, income eligibility threshold increase. Included in this request is $1.1 billion for Air Force bonuses supporting critically manned career fields, including $327 million in aviation retention programs and $21 million for cyber retention programs. This funding represents an investment in airmen and guardians that supports a strategy of attracting and retaining high quality recruits, building on an improved fiscal year 24 recruiting environment. The Space Force Military Personnel Appropriation request supports growing end strength to 9,800 guardians and increase of 400. The budget request also funds $25 million for Space Force selective retention bonuses and initial enlistment bonuses a 450% increase over the fiscal year 24 budget requests. Finally, let's turn to the military construction and military family housing appropriation. Next slide, please. We thank Congress for passing the 20, FY24 military construction appropriations bill. This legislation provides a total of $4.5 billion for Department of the Air Force MILCON and military family housing projects and operations, $786 million above the fiscal year 24 budget requests. The fiscal year 25 budget request resources 40 MILCON projects in 18 states and six overseas locations, including $1.4 billion for 24 weapon system bed down projects across 17 installations. This budget request continues to foster the department's commitment to take care of the force and their families while also focusing on investments for modern weapon system bed downs and critical infrastructure investments delivering increased glo global warfare capabilities. This budget requests $110 million for a European Defense Initiative project at Karup, Denmark, and $228 million for two Indo-Pacific projects at Yap Airfield, Micronesia, and Kadena Air Base, Japan. Additionally, this request continues to focus on addressing unaccompanied housing needs by resourcing $158 million for dormitory projects at Joint Base Langley Eustis and the Medical Education and Training Campus at Joint Base San Antonio. Also included in our request is $40 million in MILCON funding for a child development center at Bound Home Air Force Base. Finally, $222 million is included in our request for housing improvement projects at Yakota Air Base and Ramstein Air Base. MILCON and military family housing are the final budget appropriations of my portion of today's rollout. I'll now turn the briefing back to Secretary Jones for final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, General Greiner. We're facing challenging times with acute and persistent threats and adversaries like Russia and China who are working diligently to undermine our competitive advantages. Our FY25 budget request is informed by these threats and is designed to support the national defense strategy and Secretary Austin's priorities by taking care of our people, maintaining near-term readiness, and investing in the technologies and capabilities necessary to secure our competitive advantage in the long run. We're in a race for technological superiority that we expect to last several decades. The battle space is increasing, decision space is shrinking, the pace is accelerating, and we're competing with adversaries who are very serious about preparing for potential conflict, and none of them operate under a CR. We've been in a current CR for five months and since 2011 have spent nearly five years operating under a CR. And the most devastating impact is the time we lose standing still while our adversaries accelerate forward. That is time we cannot afford to lose. We cannot fight with one hand tied behind our back and we cannot properly compete in this era of great power competition with only a partial deck. I urge lawmakers to quickly pass all remaining FY24 appropriations bills and approve our FY25 budget request on time. That is the best way our lawmakers can serve our department, our service members, and our families. Thank you. And now General Greiner and I will open the floor for questions. Lee, go ahead with the first question. Lee Hudson, Politico. Uh, what went into your uh, decision to not fund aero production and what do you hope to learn from testing in fiscal year 2024? Do you want to take that? 
So you're right. We don't have any additional funding in 25. Um, there is still one remaining uh, one remaining test, uh, and we'll see when that happens. Um, all I can tell you is that we continue to learn from that. Um, we have funded Hackam, um, got I think a $517 million total in that for, 20, uh, for 25. And so um, we continue to move forward with, uh, you know, hypersonics are an important piece of the portfolio. So we continue to fund Hackam, but right now there's no additional funding in FY25 for Arrow going forward. Thank you. Steve Losey. Hi, it's Stephen Losey, Defense News. The Air Force has repeatedly said that it needs 72 fighters per year to modernize its fleet, reduce the overall age of the fleet. You just mm -hmm. say you've got, you don't have that. You've got 60 in there. How much is this going to set your modernization age reduction efforts back? And are you concerned that returning to 72 at some point in the future, beyond 25, might be out of reach? For the F-15 EXs, we are reducing the total program to 98, so th that is a change that is almost exclusively due to fiscal constraints. Uh, the F-35 story is different. Uh, we want the planes that we want, and the um, TR-3 Block 4 capabilities have been delayed. So our, our approach is to uh, minimize the impact of that by procuring fewer of those in the first years of the FIDIP, and then, as you'll see from our more detailed uh, budget exhibits that we start to come back toward the end of the fit up, hopefully uh, with all those capabilities that we need in place. Tara? Hi, thank you both for doing this, Tara Kopp with the Associated Press. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the real life impacts of having a CR for five months this year and some of the previous years, the compounding effect of that, um, particularly on your ability to get flight hours to your crews, maintenance hours, and if you end up with a year long CR, what happens? So we have lots of details. Uh, General Greiner wants to go into some of the details. Um, all of the operational imperatives that the DAF has worked so hard to do the analysis and determine what capabilities we need are basically on hold during a CR. Uh, 89 new starts, as one example. Um, national security space launches dropped from 10 to 3. Th these are uh, things that some of you have heard us say a, a number of times, that MILCON projects delayed. Um, our munitions ramp ups delayed. So uh, we have a long list of, of what we've been having to adjust to so far. And those impacts carry forward into FY25. We assumed that we would have those dollars at the beginning of the year and be able to execute those programs throughout all of 24. And now we're halfway into the year without those. But do you want to go into some of the additional details sure. with a, a year long? Yeah, just a couple other examples, perhaps. On the O&M side, it makes it really challenging. We're trying to thread that needle, making sure we don't burn too fast. Should we have to implement some sort of a reduced funding level, either at 25, 23 levels or 23 minus 1 percent? And so, you know, trying to make sure that we continue to fly the hours we need to, uh, not delay any weapons, or any uh, aircraft or anything into our depots. Um, so it's a, that's a little bit challenging. Same with the FSRM projects. We're having to slow a few of those down because I need to ensure that I have the headroom. It's about a $5 billion cut to my own m account if we actually had to implement this in 24. I would tell you one of the one of the challenges with planning for FY25 with an extended CR, um, I'll give you an example in the munitions lane. So we, if you requested last year, we had requested multi-year procurements. Um, and so when we don't know how that's going to land, especially since the, 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 the both chambers of the House have kind of given us a different view on what that's going to look like on the marks, and I don't know where that's going to land, we basically have moved forward with a multi-year, assuming that we're going to get that multi-year procurement availability. There's about a billion dollars that was in the 24 budget that moved economic order quantity funding to the left. But if that doesn't come through, if it, at the end of the day the conference report doesn't allow for us to do that, then the, the numbers that I just talked about, those plans are going to probably change because I won't have had invested the funds that I needed in 24 in order to move out quickly and, and continue that ramp in 25. So that just gives you a couple of examples of some of the things we continue to work through with a long-term CR. Hi, Shelley Mesh with Inside Defense. Could you talk about what um, counter UAS funding looks like in this budget? Is there anything in RDT&E or procurement? There is. There's about $25 million in counter UAS specifically. In 25, I can't give you, I don't have the details. We can probably track that down but as to what that goes after. But there's about $25 million in there for the Air Force for counter small UAS. And then I also wanted to ask, how does the fit up for this year change compared to what you had planned when you thought you were going to get more funding for this year. Has it changed the out years much? I would say one of the biggest concerns that we have for the out years is our weapon system sustainment. Um, 
we had to add about a billion dollars between weapon system sustainment and flying hours just to keep those even with 24. Um, given the caps that we have and the, uh, the top line that we have for the out years, we do see a continued decline in those accounts. Um, so that's something that we're looking at as we're planning for 26. How can we uh, ramp back our readiness without too negatively impacting the modernization programs that we have? So trying to find the right balance in the out years. Thanks, Shelly. Michaela? Hi, I'm Kayla Easley with Defense Scoop. Thanks for your time. Um, back to hypersonics, I was hoping if you could maybe just detail what that $517 million for Hackham will um, cover for this year. And then also, the request this year is slightly less than $557 million that was predicted for fiscal year for this year, last budget cycle. So can you provide any rationale as to why there is that slight decrease at all? Is it budget-related, FRA-related? So for Hackham, I'll have to go back and double-check the numbers because I'm tracking an increase of about $135 million. So let me take that let me take that question to double check because we're showing an actual increase in the Hackam line this for was, um, what was predicted for um, in the cross right. of last year. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll have to go back and I'll have to go back and get the details on what's changed across there. All right, thanks. And then um, I'm sorry for what is part of the um, the 517 million that will fund this year just for their development. Uh, yeah, just for additional development, additional prototyping. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Michael Hi, uh, Michael Moore with Breaking the Fence. Uh, following up on the trim to the fighter buy, did that have any impact on planned divestments since you weren't able to buy as many fighters to replace some of those aircraft that you want to retire? Um, so for the most part, our divestments were planned because we need to start moving the funding into the modernization programs. Um, I'd have to look and see if there were any changes at all, but I would say if there were, they were very minor. Um, we do have um, some divestments that are prohibited by congressional language, and we are in line with all of those. Uh, and so in general, we're doing what we need to do to keep our current force available while shifting as much funding as we can to the next generation. Thank you, ma'am. Courtney Alban? Hi, yes. Um, Space Force officials have talked a lot about the importance of commercial technologies and integrating these capabilities. Um, how does the fiscal 25 budget reflect that priority? What are some examples of that? Uh, so definitely the work with uh, space domain awareness and launches, commercial launches is a big one. Um, we're continuing to look for more areas to use commercial analytics um, in, in terms of our missile warning, missile tracking, and, and other capabilities. Um, do you have any other examples? Uh, the other big piece I would add is there's about, there's about $1.2 billion that, go toward, that goes towards um, Commercial SATCOM, so a big piece uh, in that lane as well. So, you know, well over $3 billion um, in just those couple areas alone. If I can ask, um, sort of along those lines, um, Space Systems Command has been kind of pushing for there to be a dedicated um, program line for um, space, commercial space services. Is this included um, in this year's budget request? I, I do not know that. I'll have to take that for a question to, to answer back. Thanks. Courtney? Uh, hi, Courtney. Maybe it's been on there a couple times. Um, I wanted to ask, so the Air Force is kind of remaining flat. Uh, there's 8,000 less uh, active duty for, uh, personnel um, than last year that, were sought, that are being sought. Are there programs or career fields that are looked at that are being, that could be cut or prioritized as, a, you know, as the service is looking to sort of fit its workforce needs? I'm looking at like TACP and, and so forth. So I think, I think it's important to note that the reduction that we saw between the 24 budget request and 25 is not really a reduction of people. I mean, we had, we had probably overestimated what we thought we could grow to between 23 and 24. And so this is really just a reduction of those funds. And as you see, we're, we're almost, almost you know, within 500 total alignment with the 24 NDAA. Um, with regards to specific puts and takes, we can give you a breakout on that. But again, um, most of those puts and takes are from legacy systems. So think A-10s as an example, and then continuing to bring on F-35s, KC-46s, um, those types of things. So that's where, you know, on the air side, that's where most of those are going. What's a little bit different in, on the Space Force side is last year, if you recall, from 23 to 24, we were moving our last mission over, the JTAGS mission. And so this is our first year in Space Force where we will not actually move over any additional mission capabilities from other services. So this is just a plan based on analysis, obviously, of what we think we need to execute the mission in the Space Force. And so we think the growth of 400 is, is, is keeps us lean, keeps us agile, but also allows us the right number there to get after the, to get after the mission set. Thanks. Thanks, Courtney. Tony? I have a sentinel question. Now, the arms control community is going to be looking through your budget to see if there's any Minuteman 3 sustainment funds because of the uh, non-McCready breach. 
are there any, and when would you start seeing Nun McCurdy uh, editions, you know, 28, 29, or next year? Right, so there is Minuteman sustainment through the FIDIP, so you will see uh, the ability to continue Minuteman as a viable platform. Um, as far as the Nun McCurdy impacts, that process is ongoing. OSD is leading that. We're cooperating with all of the analysis that's, that's ongoing. Uh, the report is due back um, to Congress in July. Um, and so there won't be any impacts to the 25 budget. We fully funded 24 and 25 uh, compared to the current requirements, but as the program relooks requirements, possible rephasing or other things like that, um, that will be done after the results are, are in in July and would impact next year's budget in the out years. Uh, is it possible that Minuteman 3 funds after 2026 or 27 could be boosted up, beefed up? to sustain the Minuteman 3 line if, in fact, Sentinel delays. Yes, I mean, we'll be looking at risk reduction for the whole nuclear portfolio, and there would certainly be things in that regard that we would be considering. So, General Thank Silent you. Barker, this new satellite uh, spy satellite. Oh, uh, yeah, you're you're cutting parts of it, according to the, the briefing book here. This says, reduce, reduce the Silent Barker program to remove replenishment, third system delivery. Uh, do you, did you know why they're cutting it, since it's a new program They just put up the first increments? Yeah, so uh, Silent Barker is a, is, a, is a kind of a partnership with the NRO, so right. I'll have to double check and see if there's something that's moving there, but we'll have to, I'll have to get you that back with that answer. Okay. Thanks, Tony. 40, 40, on, the, on, the, on the budget over, yeah, okay, thanks. Chris, go ahead. Hi, Chris Gordon, uh, Aaron Space Force Magazine. Uh, in very simple terms, why is the Space Force budget going down? Is that because you haven't had any new missions trans, uh, for over, and uh, what does the trend look like long term? So with the Fiscal Responsibility Act caps, across the department we needed to look at how to preserve the readiness of the force. Space Force is a little bit different in the sense that the O&M and the MILPERS accounts are very small, so there really wasn't much to trade. So as the department prioritized, prioritized across all services, we needed to make some puts and takes and some hard decisions. Um, there was also the fiscal reality related to some of the execution of programs. The Space Force budget had been increasing quite a bit over the last couple of years and making sure that, that we weren't going to have any execution issues. And then just the launch schedule was down and so that um, has some procurement savings. Is that just a coincidence or issues with contractors and getting things on time? No, I mean, the, the only issue, as I mentioned earlier, was due to the long CR. Um, we've had a delay of the NSSL launches, but we expect if we get an appropriation here in the next couple of weeks that we would be back on track. Yeah, I think it's worth noting, too, when we, when we procure launches, so, for example, as we procure launches in 24, those launches will actually take place for, like, another 18, 24 months, right? So we still have time, as the Undersecretary mentioned. We've been able to procure eight of them in 24. We still need to do seven more to get us to where we need to be, but we think we still have runway left if we get an appropriation bill here in the next couple of weeks that allows us to keep us on track there. Brian, go ahead. Hi, um, the B-21 procurement saw an increase, but it wasn't to what was expected, about $300 million less than what last year's budget projected. Can you elaborate any of the thinking on that? And related, is there any funding continuing for the long range strike family of systems operational imperative? So on the B-21, just at the classification issue, I'm not gonna be able to give you a whole lot of details on that. Um, on the second, can you repeat the second question, please? The long-range strike family of systems operational imperative. There was a few hundred million dollars in that budget last year. I, did that continue at all in this year? Quick look here. Yeah, I know there's something there. I was looking for the numbers. I'll take that one as well. I don't have the Thanks, details Ryan. on that. Thanks. Sandra? Thank you. Sandra Irwin, Space News. The uh, Space Force uh, funding, $29.4 billion, does that include classified programs? It does include classified programs. It doesn't include programs that are in the pass-through. So how much of the uh, total is classified programs? Do you have a, bre a breakdown? I don't think we're allowed to give that out either. Well, I don't. Yeah, I don't have, I don't have a roll-up of the classified piece of that. I don't. Thanks. And then this will be our last question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Teresa Hitchens, Breaking Defense. Thank you for doing this today. My question was about the, uh, about the um, protected SATCOM Global. Mm -hmm. um, is this, are these new payloads that you're procuring, or are these new satellites under the Space Systems, com that Space Systems Command is going to There'll be new space vehicles, actually, right? So there'll be, yeah, there'll still be, you know, separate satellites for X-band disaggregation and KA-band. Um, uh, I think initially right now our plan is for four space vehicles, but it, it, it could be changing. It could change over time, uh, but we're just getting started on that program. Okay, 
Yep. Thank you. Amen. And then Audrey, since that was quick. Mm-hmm. Okay, yes, <laughs> super quick. Audrey Decker went to the fence one. I just want to, back to the uh, fighter question, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly. So you're deferring the F-35s because of T-3 delays, not because of funding constraints? It's both. It's both. Yeah, we haven't changed the total program of record, but given the fiscal constraints this year, as well as the delays in getting the capabilities that we need, we rephase the program, but we haven't cut off the, the total numbers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's all we have time for today. If you have any follow-up questions at all, just let us know. Come see us afterwards. Thank you so much.